Hello, everybody. This is a poorly prepared talk. I hope to amuse you with uh, being quick. Um, I like buying toys, and for me, toys are computers. And I always want to buy toys that are interestingly different. I try to infect everybody else with this interest. You see, sometimes I post on the mailing list with suggestions, and yeah, okay. Some, some people follow them, and others wisely just watch me fool around. Scott also buys little computers. Just, we're, I'm not alone. So, I've seen a lot of people ask me, how do I buy a, a notebook for Linux? It's so scary. And it really isn't. Nowadays, they mostly work. The trouble is, there are a few potholes, and I don't remember them because they're just so obvious to me. And I say, no, no, it's not trouble. And I said, I did this. Oh, well, you should have known that. There are a few little things to watch out for. Um, once you look out for those, then you got to decide how you're going to use the notebook. And that's the really the hardest thing. I remember the first notebook I bought was a fairly small one and eventually just didn't have enough power. So the next thing I bought was enormous. And I didn't have enough power to carry it. <laughs> but other than that, it was great. I mean, to tell you an example of how it was a toy, I mean, it, you know, had fun features. It was the first 64-bit uh, processor that I got. The, and, you know, why do you need 64 bits in a notebook? Well, because I could get it. <laughs> and here's another secret. Because I could get it cheap from Tech Direct. I'm also very much into buying cheap. Not always the best choice. If you want the opposite, talk to Leonard. Leonard always says, buy what you want. It may cost more, but pay for quality. I think you buy cheap and throw it away and get another one when something else shiny comes along. <laughs> okay. Um, so what do I think are the potholes you should look out for? Just be really quick about this. First of all, don't buy anything with an atom in it because... Intel has done a terrible job of writing um, the low-level code to handle C states. It's buggy to this day. There's a two-year-old Bugzilla from the kernel that's, I don't know, let's say 76 entries long. And the in Intel people didn't even contribute to it for at least one of those years. Now they're working on it. They still haven't solved it. It's very hard to parameterize what's going wrong. But who wants a machine that hangs on you? So don't buy an Atom unless you really know what you're doing. And by Atom, I mean Bay Trail and Cherry Trail, all those things. They, they're very appealing, and some of them work. I have one that works just fine under Linux, but it's pretty scary. Um, another thing that happens is people who write the BIOSes, they have to write this ACPI code, ACPI. And sometimes they stop when it works for Windows. Not when it's correct, when it works for Windows. So sometimes you get in trouble there. Now here's an example. This is a beautiful little machine called a Dell Venue 11 Pro. Okay? It's actually a tablet. Okay? And it's got inside it one of the low-power... Haswell processors, sorry. Haswell is kind of a couple of generations back mainstream Intel processors. And the big thing about Haswell is it's the first generation which was reasonable uh, in power consumption for notebooks. So if you're buying a notebook, even an old one, try not to buy anything with a number under uh, four thousand or whatever. So this is Haswell family, so that's good. It's not Atom. Almost all tablets are Atom. Okay, so this is, I guess it's probably a related processor to what they put in the Surface Pro. This from Factory Direct, a place I don't often recommend, was $219. It's great. What has it got that makes it better than an ordinary tablet? Well, Microsoft tried to fragment the business and have cheap things and expensive things. And by cheap, they limited them to about 32 gigabytes of disk space. And 
two gigs of RAM. And those are a little unpleasant, not very comfortable. You can use them. In Windows, you pay a price. It really bogs down in various places, like doing updates, you'll pull your hair out. Um, when, Linux can work perfectly well in 32, but you can't share a disk of 32 between Windows and Linux. This has Windows 10 on it and Linux. It works fine. It's um, and it's not an atom. Okay, so, and oh, and by the way, this has got a um, 1920 by 1080 screen, which is a lot better than cheap notebooks. It's into the reasonable tablet range. So, what's bad about this? Well, uh, Microsoft invented a new way of sleeping called connected something or other. Does anybody remember what the word is? Anyway, the idea is it wakes up every once in a while and looks for email for you or something. People swear at it because that's great for a phone, but not so much for a notebook because you put the notebook in your, in your um, bag for a day and the battery's gone because it's using battery power. Yes? Is this related to the ACPI? It is, sort of. This thing, they debugged the connected whatever it's called mode and they didn't debug the sleep mode. Apparently, this doesn't even work in Windows in sleep mode. And it doesn't work in Linux in sleep mode. So I haven't powered my way through that. But here's an example of a minor failure. It's a gorgeous little machine. But here's another learning experience. I found tablets are not really a good form factor for Linux. You really want a keyboard. I'm, Android's Linux, but not in the sense I mean, an ordinary distro. And this device is great because you've got a keyboard and you can remove it. But the, it loses a little bit on balance because all the guts are up here. And this thing is lighter weight, so it tips more easily. To fix that, they put a second battery in here, which is a win. It makes it heavier, but 11 hours apparently. Of course, 11 hours without sleeping is a bit much. So anyway, so that's that's a toy I bought, $219. The cheapest you can get um, something with a screen like this normally is $500, let's say. I I didn't tell you my what I'm a glutton for. I want pixels. I love pixels a lot on my screens. Normal notebooks have... Um, 1366 by 768, that's horrible for me. I won't take it anymore. Um, I want battery life. 11 hours battery life, that's really good. Um, I want lightweight. This isn't bad. This is 10 inches. Most notebooks are 12 or more. Yes? Sorry? I don't know because I haven't powered through the sleep problem yet. That's, yeah, I have, this is the first time I've taken it outside of my house because it's not quite ready. Now, I'll be honest. This is the notebook that I do all my traveling with. This is a, an Ultrabook. It cost over $1,000 when I bought it. I hate paying over $1,000, but it works. And it's got a gorgeous screen, um, 3K this way, 1800 this way, lovely. Um, loses a little bit on battery because of that. And it's a few years old now, so it's not as good as the ones right now. One thing I recommended to people, uh, Boxing Day a year ago was something that had all the capabilities of this and just over half the price. Uh, Giles has one. Well, he's not here, I don't think. But anyway, these if you're really serious and you want to get work done, don't do what I do. <laughs> Buy something you know is going to work, and you don't have to spend a lot of time shopping for it. So everybody here has made their own decisions. In the Unix world, in the Linux world, yeah, you really are safest buying a ThinkPad. Not safe, but safest, because 
Lenovo actually cares whether Linux works on it, which isn't true of any of the others that I know of, except there's some special Dell one. Yes? So um, that, that obviously Dell is a touch screen. How, how does it work on like the Nano no, that's somewhat designed for touch screen and things like that? I've never used the touch screen except accidentally. I'm saying, oh, look, <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay. And, but I'll tell you how old school I am. I still don't, I touch type more or less, but I still don't use the left shift key because on the IBM key punches, the left shift key was a reverse shift, not the normal shift. Okay, I haven't used a key punch since the mid 70s and my fingers are still the same. So don't get, and, and the other thing I should say about a limitation of mine is I think notebooks are great. I love the idea of autonomy being able to have your whole world here. Well, it's not true anymore. You have to have the internet anyway. So for many realistic people, this is the way to be portable. This really is. You can carry it everywhere except swimming. And it's light and it kind of works. Yeah, so remember my limitations. I'm an old fogey. My habits are old habits. OK? Questions? Yes. It's great. <laughs> Once you learn it, there's a whole bunch of crazy rules you used to know before UEFI. There's a new bunch of crazy rules you have to learn, but they're not quite as insane. They're a little more wasteful. There's nothing like the bare metal of the old system. It was really, really simple. And if you knew assembly programming, you could figure it out. UEFI is a little more magical. They have a lot of firmware there that you'll never figure out. And the other bad thing is every manufacturer seems to have different conventions that are stupid. <laughs> but fundamentally, the, thing that, the only thing that annoys me about UEFI is you have to share the slash boot slash EFI directory over all the machine or all the systems on your computer unless you have two different disk drives and you steer the firmware to boot from a different one. But it'll switch back on you magically and you don't know why. So there is some, some magic involved. I've not found any poisonous brand. I find poisonous machines, but not brands. Like where there's something really stupid and they never fix it. Okay? But usually the worst thing that happens is they're fire and forget. The BIOS you get, they call it a BIOS. It's not BIOS anymore. The right term is firmware. Um, the firmware you get with most machines stays the same. The team has moved on. They'll never come back unless there's a scandalous bug. Like some companies came back and, and addressed, I think it was Rowhammer or something like that, where they changed the refresh intervals and stuff like that. They, the mo if you look at motherboards, people will do firmware updates for a while because they're open. They have to accept devices plugged in from other companies. But this box is closed, so you got what you got, you're not likely to find anything that goes bad after a while. So if there's something wrong, it usually stays wrong. Here's an example. On this one, Linux will throw a machine check interrupt sometimes with no actual bad results, but nobody likes seeing machine checks. It's a firmware bug pretty clearly. I couldn't get attention of the people that worked on this. On the ThinkPad list, I got Lenovo engineers on the ThinkPad line to look at it, reproduce it, and try to talk to the people who made this and fail. 
This is a Lenovo, but it's not a ThinkPad. So that's, that's a, I took it, it's an anecdote, but it, I took it as an example how much the ThinkPad people care and everybody else doesn't. That's right. It, they're all fire and forget. Um, Dell makes some models that are designed for Linux. I don't quite know why they do that, because they kind of abandon them afterwards sometimes. But there's some attempt there. There are some people at Dell who care, but I don't think they're the people making the laptops. Any other questions? <laughs>